या नीलम्बी का हेलो यस सर या वी कैन स्टार्ट ओके सर गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन टुडे आई एम प्रेजेंटिंग ऑन मिनिमली इन्वेजिव ग्लोकोमा सर्जरी so uh, uh, the, the, it is also called as micro invasive or micro incisional glaucoma surgery these are uh, procedures which enhance the pre existing pathways for aqueous outflow the approaches include decreasing trabecular meshwork resistance to aqueous flow improving aqueous flow through schlem's canal and or creating a low resistance pathway for aqueous flow between the anterior chamber and the supracoroidal space so uh, these uh, share five characteristics which include the high safety profile they carry a much lower risk of serious complications like hypotony choroidal effusions or choroidal hemorrhages then uh, they cause minimal disruption of the normal anatomy because they allow for enhancement of the physiological outflow then the ab interno approach is uh, uh, done uh, through a traditional clear corneal wound with direct visualization of the anatomical target the efficacy they offer meaningful iop lowering effect the level of iop reduction is often inferior to traditional filtering surgeries but it is at least 20% alternatively patients who do not experience an iop decrease should attain the reduction of at least one medication so they are not as effective as surgical uh, methods but uh, they are uh, they are uh, at least they provide 20% iop lowering effect and also ease of use for patients and physicians they allow for a rapid recovery with minimal additional downtime for patients and should be easily incorporated into traditional phaco emulsification surgery so just to brief upon the uh, outflow pathway uh, the uh, aqueous which is produced by the ciliary processes goes into the posterior chamber and through the pupil it enters the anterior chamber and the exit is marked by two major pathways which is a trabecular outflow and the uveo scleral outflow so the trabecular outflow the, uh, from the anterior chamber the uh, uh, aqueous goes into the trabecular meshwork through that the schlem's canal the collector channels the epis and the episcleral veins uh, the other Third method, uh, the uveo scleral outflow, uh, the aqueous passes through the ciliary body into the supra choroidal space and uh, exits through the venous circulation of the ciliary body sclera and the orbit. So, trabecular outflow forms the majority. It is seventy-five to ninety percent of the aqueous is drained out through this pathway. The outflow facility is about point one to point four microliter per minute per mmHg, and it is a pressure dependent pathway. uh there is free free flow occurs up to the juxta canalicular or trabecular meshwork which offers the uh, maximum resistance to outflow and the resistance increases with age due to increase with age due to uh, uh, increased extracellular matrix so uveo scleral outflow forms to about 10 to 25% of the total outflow and it is a not uh, it is not pressure dependent the aqueous will pass through face of the ciliary body in the angle enter the ciliary muscle and the supra choroidal space so there are three uh, approaches which can be applied in minimally invasive glaucoma surgery the first approach involves enhancing outflow across the trabecular meshwork and through the schlem's canal which include these pathways which include the trabecular bypass uh, which has i stent i stent inlet and schlem's dilatation which is the ab interno canaloplasty and hydrus and trabeculotomy including the gat the trabeculotome and the cahook dual blade then uh, the second group of mi this approaches seek to increase outflow via alternate pathways like a pathway through the to the supra choroidal space which uh, has a side pass and i stent supra and through the uh, subconjunct subconjunctival space which is a zengel stent uh then the third mijs approach involves a decreasing the aqueous production by ablation of the ciliary body which includes the endocyclophotocoagulation so first coming to the trabecular bypass devices uh they are designed to create a low resistance pathway between the anterior chamber and the schlem's canal so there are two types of trabecular meshwork bypass one is the stent placement and the other is the tissue excision so for stent placement we have three types we have the i stent the i stent inject which is the second generation and uh, the third is the hydrus then uh, tissue excision uh, includes cahook uh, dual blade trabectome gat and uh, abic 
So coming to the first one, which is ice tent, uh, we have two generations. The first generation ice tent, this is the first picture as we can see. It is an L-shaped design. It is uh, designed to pierce the trabecular meshwork tangentially. It has several retention rings on the outer aspect of the hollow body of the ice tent, which are designed to keep the stent in place. Then the device is indicated for treatment of mild to moderate glaucoma and is improved for implantation at the time of phaco emulsification. Uh, the second generation eye stent, uh, it has a um, it has a head, it has a thorax and a phalange that remains in the anterior chamber. The two eye stent inject devices are implanted in the same eye. So this is also approved for mild to moderate glaucoma and can be done along with phaco surgeries. So as we can see, this is a uh, one mm. Stent. The first generation is a one mm stent. It is made of heparin coated titanium. It has a central lumen of about one twenty microns. Can be implanted during cataract surgery. It is a preloaded single use sterile injector with a single eye stent device, and it is implanted in the Schlem's canal in the nasal angle. The eye stent inject, the second generation, it is a 360 micron stent. It is also made of heparin coated titanium and has a central lumen of about 80 microns. Uh, it is preloaded, it is single use, and it is a sterile injector which has two stents uh, loaded in it. So these, so once the injector uh, is put inside, both the stents can be implanted in the nasal angle, approximately two to three clock hours apart. So uh, let's just see a video. There is no audio to this video. Okay, I'll just say uh, there is audio actually. Is it not audible? Uh, no, not audible. I think you have not shared the computer sound. So you can stop sharing again while sharing. Uh, you can click on that. You have clicked on that share computer sound. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Yes. And now you can play and increase the volume of the video. The salt of the yeah, push it it from the beginning. Okay. Pushing up the epistural vessels around the limbus. In this case, we're implanting the eye stent prior to phacal emulsification. The head has been turned and microscope tilted, and we have a Swan Jacob lens to visualize the nasal angle. In the supranasal angle, we're going to enter the meshwork at a 30 degree angle, noticing the self trephinating tip approaching the inner wall with this 30 degree acute angle. This allows adequate entrance into the canal, avoiding trapment within the inner wall itself. Once we get a third of the device into the canal, it's important to lift toward the hand and straighten the hand out to allow smooth passage of the implant within the canal. The snorkel end is then released gently and we then observe the position of the snorkel within the inner wall itself. Tapping on the implant itself to, to push it against the canal and as well as pushing the snorkel end against the outer wall ensure adequate placement. It is quite normal and expected to see some blood reflux emanating from the insertion and from the snorkel end itself. Here, our second eye stent is being placed, this time in a backhanded fashion, again approaching the angle at 30 degree angle approach. The self trephinating tip incised the inner wall, and the main body of the device is slid into the canal by straightening the hand out and pulling toward us slightly to ensure smooth passage. The snorkel is then released from the implanter gently, and again, the tip is used to push the snorkel against the outer wall and tap the device to ensure it is well seated. It's important that the elbow of the device is placed fully within the canal itself. Viscoelastic is used to help visualization and move the blood away from the area of interest. 
Here our third eye stent is being used, again entering at a third degree angle. Once a third of the device is inside the canal, straighten the hand out, pull toward the incision slightly, and allow for smooth passages within the canal. It's important as we saw here that the eye moves very little to ensure that we're not torquing the eye and hitting the outer wall during the implantation. We can visualize the three implants being placed approximately two clock hours, two clock hours away from each other. Here a closer view shows the nice flush appearance of the snorkel end emanating from the inner wall. So this was the uh, placement of the eye stent, the first generation implant. As we can see, they placed three stents and two clock, cl two clock hours uh, away from each other. Note the distribution. Uh, coming to the eye stent inject. So this is how it looks like. So after an incision is made and uh, viscoelastic is injected, we apply the Swan Jacob lens. And this is the injector. So placing this is a little easier because we don't have to go uh, parallel. We can just do give perpendicular, we can insert. Again, two devices are injected. Since the injector has preloaded two devices, we, there is no need of withdrawing and then going back inside. So, two devices are played, two to three clock hours away from each other. Okay, so uh, effectiveness, there was a two-year study comparing cataract surgery combined with implantation of the first generation eye stent and cataract surgery alone, which found that patients receiving the eye stent were more likely to achieve a 20% reduction in unmedicated IOP, but it was not statistically significant. And uh, eye stent patients were statistically more likely to have an unmedicated IOP 21 mmHg. Uh, in a similar two-year study of the eye stent inject device, the second generation, it, they, uh, patients underwent a medication washout at baseline and the conclusion of the study in the micro stent group, mean diurnal IOP reduction was greater. And there was a higher likelihood of achieving 20% reduction in unmedicated IOP. Mm -hmm. The next, we come to hydrus implant, which is similar to the eye stent in that hydrus is designed to traverse the trabecular meshwork. However, this device is also designed to dilate the Schlem's canal over approximately three clock hours. As we can see in this uh, uh, picture, uh, it is 8 mm length and made of uh, nickel and titanium alloy. Um, it can be implanted during phaco surgery and it will span about 90 degree of the angle and works both as a trabecular meshwork bypass tent and it will also work as a scaffold in the Schlem's canal. So let's see the implantation of this device. Uh, after viscodilatation and uh, using the Swan Jacob lens, the entire uh, device is passed into the canalicular area. And a part of the uh, end is still kept inside the uh, aqueous chamber. So it is left like this. So this was hydrus implant. Uh, the next we come to methods uh, of trabecular disruption. These procedures are designed to disrupt or remove the inner wall of the Schlem's canal and trabecular meshwork. They will open the canal and downstream the collector channels directly to aqueous outflow. So the first device is trabectome, which is used to ablate the trabecular meshwork and inner wall of Schlem's canal. And device consists of a handpiece with a tip that ablates the tissue by means of a bipolar 550 kilohertz electrode. There are also irrigating and aspirating ports to dissipate heat, and remove the debris uh, liberated during the procedure and maintain the anterior chamber stability. The, there have not been any prospective randomized trials yet to compare efficacy of trabectome to uh, cataract surgery alone. 
So this is indicated for patients with various types of open angle glaucoma, ocular hypertension, and can be used in some patients with angle closure glaucoma. Trabectome can be performed in conjunction with cataract surgery or as a standalone procedure, and it can be performed in patients who are phakic, aphakic, or pseudophakic. So after making a scleral uh, scleralization, uh, viscoelastic is applied. And then the lens is applied. Trabecular meshwork is ablated. The device is brought into the anterior chamber, rotated 180 degrees, and further ablation is done. So, this overclump comes the uh, resistance which is there. Then, the next device is the Kahook dual blade. Uh, conventional goniotomy is most effective in primary congenital glaucoma, however, it has been attempted in other forms of trachoma as well. The Kahook dual blade is a device designed to allow the surgeon to perform an excisional goniotomy by removing a of a strip of tissue from the trabecular meshwork and the inner wall of Schlem's canal. The Kahook dual blade goniotomy can be performed in patients with open angle glaucoma, ocular hypertension, and certain patients with angle closure glaucoma. It can be performed at the time of cataract surgery as a standalone or as a standalone in phakic, pseudophakic, and uh, phakic eyes. So let's see. So after making a clear corneal incision. Viscoelastic is added. So the device has a sharp tip, it will easily penetrate the trabecular meshwork. A ramp is created and the foot plate is entered into the anterior wall of Schlem's mm -hmm. canal. There are dual blades present which create parallel incision in the trabecular meshwork. the outside end technique. The next is the inside out technique. So, how so many clockers generally it is done? Uh, sir, around uh, three clockers. And which quadrant which? is preferred? Sir, uh, the nasal quadrant is there. Okay. Yes, so, mostly MIGS, they are done sitting temporarily with clear corneal incisions. 
So it has to be the nasal quadrant that is more accessible. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, the next method is gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. Then it is similar to the ab external 360 degree suture trabeculotomy, except that the suture is introduced into the Schlem's canal through an intracameral approach. An alternate term for three uh, of for GAT is 360 degree ab internal suture trabeculotomy. An advantage of GAT over the ab external procedure is that it spares the conjunctiva. It can be performed in adult or pediatric patients with open anti-glaucoma and a clear cornea and can be performed as a standalone procedure or in combination with FACO. So no prospective comparative studies are there for this, but a, retros a retrospective study of one in 98 eyes showed an average reduction of IOP of about 9 mmHg in primary open angle glaucoma patients and a 14 mmHg in secondary open angle glaucoma patients at 24 months after the GAT. So the procedure. This is a video showing suture GAT or gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. First, an approximate measure of the length of 5-0 proline suture required for the surgery is made by looping it around the limbus and making a kink at the end point of the expected length of the suture. Using a low temperature cautery, the tip of the suture is flanged or blunted into a small mushroom head to make it atraumatic. Paracentesis is made with super sharp blade directed towards the nasal angle. The flange tip suture is introduced through the paracentesis directed towards the nasal angle. Another paracentesis is made on the temporal side for introduction of instruments like MSD forceps and MVR blade into the anterior chamber. Anterior chamber is filled with high molecular weight viscoelastic like orogen. A drop of OVD is placed over the cornea and the patient's head is turned away from the surgeon by 35 degrees and the microscope is tilted towards the surgeon by 35 degrees to visualize the angle structures under the swan jacob conio lens. 23 gauge MVR blade is introduced under gonioscopic visualization and one clock hour goniotomy is performed. Bleeding from the Schlem's canal is an indication of goniotomy being performed at correct anatomical position. Using orogel, the area of bleeding is taken care of so as to visualize the goniotomy. Using MSC forceps, the suture is caught hold of and the tip is advanced to be introduced into the goniotomy. With gentle and circumferential strokes, the suture is advanced into the Schlem's canal till it starts appearing from the opposite end of the goniotomy. Once the suture appears from the opposite end of the goniotomy, it is grasped with MHC forceps above the initial suture and brought to the center of the anterior chamber, creating a trabeculotomy on the superonasal side. Gonioscope is taken out. With McPherson's forceps, the suture is pulled from outside, creating an internal trabeculotomy of 360 degrees. Thank you. So this was GAT. Uh, then the next is TRAP 360 Omni, which uh, is a single-use handpiece that allows surgeon to perform trabeculotomy through a clear corneal incision. In this, the tip of the handpiece is used to pierce the trabecular meshwork and the microcatheter is advanced from the tip of the device, threaded through 180 degrees of the Schlem's canal. With the microcatheter still in the Schlem's canal, the device is retracted from the eye, so tearing the microcatheter through the trabecular meshwork for 180 degrees. The device is then rotated and reinserted and the procedure is repeated for the remaining 180 degrees of the angle to accomplish a 360 degree treatment. So, uh, the next is Visco 360 Omni, which is a single-use, single-handed device with a sharp distal tip used to pierce the trabecular meshwork. Microcatheter is advanced through 180 degrees of the Schlem's canal and a predetermined amount of viscoelastic is injected into the canal and distal collector channel. So, the, there is viscodilatation occurring of the Schlem's canal. The next is ab interno canaloplasty. Uh, you, it uses a specially designed illuminated microcatheter that is introduced into the Schlem's canal via an internal approach. The viscoelastic is injected through the microcatheter into the Schlem's canal to viscodilate the canal and possibly the downstream collector channels. 
so the technique is the procedure is similar to gat however visco elastic is injected while the catheter is advanced into the canal and a goniotomy is not performed unless specifically desired so this is a video introducing eye track the only illuminated microcatheter designed for minimally invasive glaucoma surgery with ab interno canaloplasty. Before commencing treatment, prime the eye track with high molecular weight viscoelastic. Once fully primed, viscoelastic will ooze from its tip. Featuring an atraumatic tip and lubricious coating, eye track can be maneuvered past partially obstructed areas of the canal. While its illuminated tip can be continuously monitored during the procedure. The surgeon will sit temporal to the patient to create the keratome incision. A second incision, approximately two clock hours from the intended goniotomy site, is made with a 25 gauge or 27 gauge needle and directed towards the nasal angle. Next, the anterior chamber is inflated and pressurized with a cohesive viscoelastic. The eye track is then placed through the side port incision. Using the RPT all-in-one forceps, the surgeon will enter the anterior chamber through the keratome incision and traverse until the tip of the forceps reach the trabecular meshwork. Lightly score the most anterior pigmented portion of the meshwork with the RPT all-in-one forceps and gently pull down the lower flap to create a small goniotomy, exposing the inner lumen of Schlem's canal. Place the eye track into Schlem's canal at a slight upward 15 degree approach using the RPT all-in-one forceps. Once intubated, the canal will be circumnavigated 360 degrees. During canal intubation, the eye track separates the herniations of the meshwork into the collector channels. It also breaks inner lumen adhesions and opens the stenotic segments of the canal. Once the eye track has navigated 360 degrees of Schlem's canal, it is slowly withdrawn. The technician will give approximately nine clicks of viscoelastic per quadrant with the visco injector, as instructed by the surgeon. This process of viscodilation separates the compressed tissue planes of the meshwork and triggers the withdrawal of herniated inner wall tissue from the collector channels. It also dilates and flushes the newly opened collector channels. Once the canal and distal system have been viscodilated, the eye track is removed and all residual viscoelastic is removed. Uh, next we come to aqueous, uh, next we come to shunts so the first is aqueous shunt into the supracoroidal space so currently there are no uh, devices approved by the us fda to shunt aqueous into the supracoroidal space so there was a device named cypress micro stent which was a tube shaped device placed in the anterior chamber angle to create a conduit from anterior chamber to the supracoroidal space which was available formerly uh, in a two year prospective randomized control trial cypress combined with the cataract surgery demonstrated an additional IOP reduction of 2 mmHg below baseline compared with cataract surgery alone. But despite its efficacy, the device was recalled by the FDA in 2018 because increased endothelial cell loss was observed during extended observation of patients in the pivotal clinical trial. So as we can see in this picture from the aqueous to the supracoroidal space, uh, this microstent is placed. This is Shannon Wong in Austin, Texas. I'm going to present this case of placement of a CyPass microstent for management of glaucoma. The CyPass is indicated for concurrent use at the time of cataract surgery. This is the insertion mechanism. We're told to place pressure at the tip where the yellow arrow is. This is the zoomed in view of the microstent itself. There are notable three retention rings that are visible distal to the collar of the stent. One needs to develop a familiarity with the gonioscopic anatomy of the anterior chamber angle to place this microstent which fits into the 
superciliary space. The patient does note a small amount of discomfort on initial placement of the stent. And in this case, you can see the patient moves just a little bit. This is our early experience with the Cypass micro stent. Some cases there is bleeding from the area of placement. In some cases, there's no bleeding whatsoever. In this case, there was a little bit of blood. So we managed it by placing additional viscoelastic into the eye. Proper placement endpoint is notable by the collar of the Cypass micro stent lining up evenly with the pigmented trabecular meshwork. Placement of an eye stent is similar in nature to placement of the Cypass micro stent. Both um, are fairly, uh, fairly easy to place. Our early experience has been positive with the Cypass micro stent. The Cypass should be a nice addition to our tool chest of modalities available to treat glaucoma. To help patients, this is Shannon. Uh, the next is a stent of, uh, to the subconjunctival space, the Zen gel stent and the pressor flu micro shunt. These are two devices that shunt aqueous humor to the subconjunctival space. Unlike traditional plate-based tube implants, these devices do not have a plate attached to the subconjunctival portion of the tube. So the Zen gel implantation in the pivotal study for the FDA, 75% of patients had 20% reduction of IOP at 12 months, 32% required post-operative transconjunctival needle revision, and 25% had a transient hypotony. Potential complications are similar to those of trabeculectomy and tube shunt, including choroidal effusion, tube erosion, and prolonged hypotony and infection. The Zen Gel Stent is 6 millimeters in length, and when hydrated, it minimally swells and becomes soft and flexible. The gel stent is preloaded in a disposable injector with a 27 gauge needle. The Zen Gel Stent device creates a permanent channel through the sclera, allowing flow of aqueous humor from the anterior chamber into the subconjunctival space. The Zen gel stent is inserted using the Zen injector via an ab interno approach through a small corneal incision. The injector enters the incision and travels across the eye, through the peripheral cornea, and across the anterior chamber to the superior nasal quadrant, where the stent will be placed. The needle is inserted through the trabecular meshwork and completely through the sclera, creating a scleral tunnel to the subconjunctival space. Once the needle exits the sclera, the location is verified or adjusted as needed. The injector is further advanced until the full bevel of the needle is visible. The needle is then rotated toward 12 o'clock. This rotation may help keep the soft stent from curling. The gel stent is delivered by activating the slider on the one-handed injector while the other hand maintains gentle fixation on the eye. The Zen injector allows the surgeon to advance and deliver the Zen gel stent to the desired location. Once the needle is aligned with the desired entry point in the interior chamber angle, the surgeon should advance the needle in the interior chamber angle and sclera until the surgeon is able to visualize the needle bevel as it exits the sclera into the subconjunctival space creating a permanent channel through the sclera, allowing flow of aqueous humor from the interior chamber into the subconjunctival space. The Zen gel stent lumen is designed to regulate the outflow. The aqueous humor will begin to flow, creating an ab interno bleb, which over time becomes a low-lying drainage area. The Zen gel stent is now in place and can effectively help lower IOP. So, uh... Um, the next is a pressor flow micro shunt, which is an externally placed non plated tube implant currently undergoing FDA evaluation. So, coming to the last method, which is reducing aqueous production by ciliary body ablation, it is known as an endocyclophotocoagulation. It is performed with an endoscopic probe attached to a laser unit, which includes a diode laser 810 nanometers, a xenon light source, and a helium neon aiming beam and fiber optic imaging. The connected video monitor provides for endosc endoscopic viewing by the surgeon and a foot pedal will allow the surgeon to control the laser.
The probe comes in a 19, 20 or 23 gauge size, which is either straight or curved and is inserted into the anterior chamber through a clear corneal incision. The laser setting starts at 0.2 to 0.25 watts. A continuous cycle and power is titrated to achieve both blanching and contraction of the ciliary processes. The treatment typically consists of 200 to 360 degrees of the angle. Indications include, uh, it can be used to treat patients with a wide range of glaucoma severity from mild to severe or refractory as well as most glaucoma subtypes. It is most commonly used in open angle glaucoma, but it also has a particular advantageous role in the treatment of angle closure or plateau iris, where it can function to deepen the angle. It can be performed in conjunction with phaco emulsification or as a standalone procedure in phacic or pseudo phacic patients. ECP can also be performed in conjunction with other angle blaze procedures above to provide additional IOP loading. So first FACO is performed, and then uh, after removal of the elastic and pupil expansion device, viscoelastic is injected beneath the iris this time. So we are trying to create an iris bombay kind of situation. So endocyclic photocoagulation is performed after entry. About 240 to 360 degree of the ciliary processes can be treated based on the severity of the glaucoma which is there. So we can see how the ablation occurs. So if a curved probe is used, there is more degrees that we can cover. So uh, in conclusion, MIGS procedures are an especially useful treatment option in pati patients with poor medication tolerance, poor compliance and patients who, may, who need more IOP lowering than drops or laser trabeculoplasty can provide and can be easily incorporated along with a routine phaco emulsification surgery and can be used in patients who are well controlled on drops but who desire drop independence. Uh, the field of MIGS has expanded rapidly in the last decade adding to the global coma surgeons are maintaining and their ability to tailor surgical approaches to each specific patient and future devices and surgical approaches will continue to be de uh, developed in the coming years. So uh, th uh, these are the uh, summarizing each one of them. We have the bypass methods, the Schlem's canal bypass, which includes eye stent, eye stent inject and uh, then Schlem's dilatation, which can be done through ab internal canaloplasty and hydrus. Trabeculotomy, which can be done by GAT, trabeculectome, and a Kahoot dual blade. Then the stent into supracoroidal space, which is the Cypass stent, the subconjunctival space, the Zen gel stent, and the ciliary body approach, uh, which is the endocyclophotocoagulation. Thank you. Thank you, Nilambika. Can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, Josna, you can elaborate on the methods and what exactly are advantages or disadvantages uh, practically. Yes, sir. Uh, looking into the first uh, category, that is trabecular bypass. Uh, 
these uh, stents, I think we can combine them, all these MIGS procedures, they're mainly uh, the advantage is that we can combine them with the FACO emulsification procedure itself. Uh, the first category pro procedures I stent here, we have to do it after the FACO emulsification procedure, whereas uh, for trabeculotomy, that is GAT and uh, Kahoot dual blade, uh, these procedures need to be done before the FACO emulsification. And uh, I think coming to... Yes, uh, why uh, why before FECO for GAT and trabeculotomy or Kahook blade also is done I think after FECO in the uh, uh, Usually like uh, for eye stents and all, um, it's a very small, uh, the smallest implant all over the world that is known. During, if we place it before the FECO procedure, mm -hmm. there are chances that it might get displaced with the fluid right. dynamic mm -hmm. and also um, for the other thing, it might get even blocked with smaller FACO fragments, the lens fragment. That is one thing. So these have to be placed after the lens implantation. And uh, trabeculotomy, your... Uh, uh, I'm not sure why it is done before FACO exactly. Uh, one thing is there are chances of bleeding into the angle. Uh, so we need to... Uh, inflate the angle with visco that could be one thing uh, that's what is uh, given in the uh, in the studies okay so uh, basically trabecular tommy we are removing the ball of the slam scanner or yeah. trabecular meshwork so in that case is there any starring which later is seen on bonioscopy it it should be seen sir okay and uh, one more thing, like uh, for pediatric age group, is any of these uh, used or it's only, what is the primary indication? It's used mainly for open angle glaucoma? Yes, sir. Open angle and uh, PA, some of the PXF glaucomas, it's known, uh, it can be used. Okay. Uh, contraindications are NVG and angle closure, complete angle closure, like sinical closure. Right, okay. And, and then uh, other contraindication is uh, corneal opacity because we need a clear uh, view for all these uh, surgeries. Right. It cannot be performed in any corneal opacity cases. Yes, except maybe the transcleral yes, photocoagulation, yes. which, which we are doing yes. can be used. Yes. Yeah. So uh, another thing is that generally, like the glaucoma surgeons prefer the standard trabeculectomy, uh, trabeculectomy procedure sorry, uh, trap procedure plus uh, mitomycin C for most of the surgeries. So what are the cases where this MIGS comes into play? What are the advantages of MIGS? Usually it is preferred uh, to be combined with patients who are non-compliant with medications and also who cannot afford medications. And also there should be mild to moderate glaucoma. Uh, where only 20% of an IOP reduction is expected with these procedures. So, so generally, mild, moderate glaucomas are the cases. We generally do not use it for advanced cases. Is that right? Or yes, for sir. advanced cases also, it can be just an additional procedure. Additional when all other procedures have been done and still the patient is progressing. Maybe this could be another option. Yeah. <clears throat> Because all these procedures involve con con uh, like uh, considerable cost also, where uh, specifically where any implant is used, I think it becomes expensive yes. procedure. Yes. Uh, any uh, this thing experience with the subcyclo laser that we are doing? What 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 are the outcomes? Uh, I have done some two three cases uh, recently started in the past two three months. Uh, mainly I have done DLCP more than subcyclo. Uh, DLCP is definitely a, a good thing for painful blind eyes. Like they are immediately relieved of pain and they are co quite comfortable within the first follow-up itself. Yes. Even we continue the medications for some more time, but they are definitely relieved of those epithelial bullae. They uh, drastically reduce in the first follow-up follow itself. The cornea becomes clear, even though pressures are still high uh, in the range of 30 to 40, but they don't have that pricking sensation, watering uh, that is caused because of the bullae. And uh, some cyclo, uh, I have seen Dr. Sneha doing in Belgam itself for a patient with advanced glaucoma and uh, tunnel vision. 
and uh, he has been reduced of he was on all possible glaucoma medications and now he's come back to one medication after the procedure with tunnel vision so he was uh, in no way a candidate for uh, trabeculectomy because of the tunnel vision there was chances of wipe out if we would take him for the uh, traditional uh, surgery so this is an option in such cases where we cannot do traditional surgery yeah i think in all these uh, cases i think where mijs has a one advantage that the chances of complication are less so though chances of hypotonia are there with some implants but still it is not as uh, you know high as probably a valve surgery or a trap surgery is that right so safety yes. factor is little bit more with yes. these procedures and also since we are not opening the eye to the uh, subconjunctal space except the uh, maybe the zangel implant uh, i think the chances of uh, late onset uh, infections are also not there which is though rare but can happen with trap surgeries uh, yes. later uh, you know after if the conjuncta becomes ischemic or the blebs get inflamed that also reduces with the and i another think another advantage is that uh, this is this bridge the gap between medical management uh, and uh, traditional incisional surgery where we do not touch the conjunctiva until the late stages and we can have additional uh, sight years for the patient hmm. as long as he is maintaining with this procedure and the last option can be inc incisional surgery when we do not have i mean when he is not uh, tolerating this procedure also or if it's still progressing then we always have an option to go ahead with trabeculectomy so generally now the steps like initially it was just medication and then surgery now we can start with medication and we have many medication options yes. also almost four five categories five. of drugs yeah uh, if the patient is not tolerating or the target iop is not reached then we can go ahead with probably a subcyclo laser where yeah. it's minimally invasive yeah. and can reduce the amount of medication patient is on plus yes. also uh, spares as you said the conjunctiva and also the angles is very yeah and the third step can be a maybe a goniotomy based uh, or trabeculectomy trabeculotomy based procedure like cow blade dual blade or bang or yes. a cat procedure where we are opening up the slims Uh, canal and trabecular meshwork is open, so that may give additional, you know, benefit. Again, the chances of complications are again less with that. Stent can be another option in the same category, but of course, its cost is a bit prohibitive factor, particularly in our scenario. Uh, yes. And then the last could be like either uh, we can go ahead with the trabec uh, like this Tra trabeculectomy or. Valve procedure later on. So now we have got like four or five steps of management, which is good, rather yeah. than just having two steps where medication if fails directly, we are going for the invasive procedure. We have micro invasive procedures in between. Exactly. So any questions, students, fellows, you can ask Dr. Joshin. i am yet to perform one of the mijs apart from uh, subcyclo <laughs> these are all yeah. yeah but i think easier procedures uh, yes sir looks like the only concern we have is the cost involved and uh, as you know with the conventional procedure we are more sure of iop reduction yes uh, mijs the iop reduction is not as high as in trabeculectomy Uh, so we can expect moderate response of around fifteen to twenty percent decrease, which is also, you know, fine enough because uh, we are reducing medication and at the without uh, having extra risk to the eye. Yeah, yes, I think that's what we should look into. Yes, I think uh, before taking up the patient for the procedures, we'll have to explain all this to the patient that in future you might need medications again or you might need another surgery. Yes, so that becomes an important thing. and uh, for surgeons i think we'll have to be well versed with the gonio part if we have to have uh, good surgeries as long as we are not uh, familiar with gonio surgical gonioscopes i think we do have a learning curve for that yeah so initially in normal cases also we can do gonioscopy and uh, learn how to do surgical gonioscope 
and then we can do procedures. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Thank, yes, you, thank you, Nilambika. Very thank good. You, Nilambika. Very good presentation. Thank you. Sir.